you have to listen to the world. You have to observe the world. The world is speaking to you, and you've got to observe what it's saying and then be open to that and then use that as part of your creativity rather than just try and control everything. Today we are really extremely lucky and pleased to have Matt Thompson. He is a multi-award winning BBC radio producer and sound artist. He's been haunting the wilder shores of sound and media experimentation for 25 years, making radio dramas and documentaries that are as beautiful as they are startling. How you first noticed radio as something other than acoustic wallpaper? How you first thought about it as a possible vocation? Like a lot of people when I was <laughs> growing up, the radio was on in the background. My parents would listen to the BBC, Radio 2, Radio 4, occasionally Radio 3. Once I was in a small cottage in Scotland, just listening to the sort of radio there, and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy came on. I didn't know anything about it, it just was there. What is this? It, it didn't really seem to make any sense. It jumped around, it was unpredictable, and it just seemed to be of another place. And that was the first bit of radio that I ever really noticed. I didn't actively sort of seek a career in radio. It just was really a process of osmosis and noticing, you know, another example of that actually, as I remember hearing um, Heroes by David Bowie on the radio and thinking, you know, what is this? Again, it was sort of like another world. And I think that's what attracted me to those um, bits of sound. Can you tell us about one of your early story ideas or early project ideas that you came up with or pitched to the BBC? It took me a long time to get into the BBC. It's, it was very hard to get into the BBC. I applied something like um, 10 times in, in total. During my interview, because loads of us were interviewed, they would just spring these questions on us and they'd say, OK, um, what would you like to make a program about? And I said, I'd like to make a program about um, Wittgenstein, the philosopher, and his blue and uh, brown books. And they said, um, one of the interview interviewers, I could tell really wanted me to, to sort of pass the interview, if you like, and was looking at me ex sort of quite expectant in an expectant way. And they said, well, how would you start the program? So I said, um, I'd have one of Ludwig Wittgenstein's famous statements from his blue and brown books. I'd have it read by an actor. And then I looked across at her, and she was just shaking her head without the other people on the panel noticing. She's just sort of going like this. So I said, no, 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 that's a terrible idea. Uh, and then I remembered that Wittgenstein when he was not doing his philosophy, loved to go to the cinema and watch these really trashy Western films. So I explained that and I said I'd start with um, thundering hooves and gunfire. And that would be an unexpected way of having a program about Wittgenstein. And then she just sort of went like this. <laughs> but I never actually made that program. There's time yet. Yeah. Can you explain in, in general terms your approach to radio and sound? Certainly for me, it's important that the audience doesn't know what's going to happen next within a story. And that always leaves you with the problem that if you're telling a story or a narrative, they take certain form. So how do you subvert the narrative form while still Main, still having a story that people want to engage, listen on to, because people, you want people to listen on and not leave your program. And then stylistically, I'm a, I come from documentaries, so I'm essentially a realist. But I believe that it sounds a bit sort of mystical, this. I'm not a religious person, but I sort of believe that there is isn't an alternative world that is going along in parallel to this world. So from this realistic setting, occasionally I invite the listener to sort of step through the door into another place. That's my offer, really, to the listener. 
the world's greatest scientists, shrunk on Galileo Galilei, GG to his friends, was born in the shadow of the Leaning Tower of Pisa in the days when it didn't lean so much and everyone believed in Aristotle, who said heavy things fall much faster than light ones. GG believed in ordeals, now known as experiments. I'm at the top of the Leaning Tower with a cannonball and a stone. <laughs> They hit the ground together. Aristotle said the earth stood still, the sun went around it, the Bible agreed. Sun, stand still! That's not what I see through my telescope. I'll publish. Hey, come on, open up! This is the Inquisition! Guilty! Lock him in his house forever! Gigi went blind and died. But he was right all along! I'm not sure how much of a picture you have in your head when you hear that version of Galileo or whatever. Sound-wise, uh, all the sounds are literal, but just highly exaggerated. I worked with another guy called Rex Bruff, who's absolutely brilliant at working with sound. So I'd encourage all of you, whatever you do, don't think that you can do everything yourself, even if you can sort of do everything yourself, because there might be someone else out there who spent a lot more time thinking about this, like Rex. So not only did Rex do all those sounds for me, um, I learned from Rex. Is it hard with no visuals getting character on radio? When it comes to characterization, if you think um, radio, radio surely m must be at a disadvantage compared with, say, television or, in, or film, because you can't actually see the people. I know that's sort of obvious. But if you, actually, if you listen to people's voices, if you hear someone, if someone calls you on the telephone, you start to sort of build a picture of what that person's like. Martin will play a clip which is from a program called The Craft of Crime. And it was about how um, in the old days you used to have these criminality, professional criminals were highly skilled craftspeople. But over time, they've just sort of in a way become market traders and it's become de-skilled as a job. It's very appealing, very appealing. I mean, I know people who've dedicated their lives to being the most smackiest smack addict ever because they just get into it so badly and they love that sort of horrible, smacky, nasty smackhead I mean, I do have a lot of problem with, with that because with that, I just can't stand people because they're, so, they're so, A, they're incredibly boring and they're, just, and they're just pathetic. All this thing started in the snooker hall, really. Most of the lads in there, they had their little games. They were ducking and diving one way or another. So, you know, we were talking mainly scallywags there, birds of a feather and all that sort of thing. You do tend to mix with your own, not necessarily other armed robbers, but people have their games and it is, it's a sort of, it's its own little culture. All of us, I think we were all born too late. Because I think if we'd have been born 200 years ago, we'd have all been pirates. You open a safe and you think this is the one, then you open another one. But this has got to be the one. It's like the old gold prospector. He keeps digging and digging till he finds. And you find that a lot, a lot of criminals are very persistent people. They'll keep at it. So, yeah, useful advice there, actually. If you're, <laughs> you've got to be quite persistent and keep at it. So if you think about those characters there, you sort of start to think, you sort of feel like, you know, it's interesting because the, the second character was using quite a lot of cliches, like, you know, we're all scallywags, birds of a feather, it's got its own culture. So even though he's using cliches, you felt that you knew something about that armed robber. And then the drug dealer had a kind of edgy quality about her. Edgy, possibly unreliable. The safe cracker had a very quiet voice, partly because he spent so much time in prison. <laughs> but also, it's the nature of safe cracking. My hope is that, that was the very start of the program, my hope is if you just caught that on the radio, you think, oh well, I'll give this another five minutes. So the voice itself, the quality of the voice is tied into the, the personality of the people that you're, you're representing. You, you know, if you read books about narrative, they talk about things like characterization and plot. But character and plot, they're totally intertwined. 
So, you know, as you start to think about who that safe cracker is, you're starting to think he might tell you about some story about how he opened a safe. Most civilians can identify very easily a writer's contribution to a story that you hear on the radio or see on the telly. Most people can identify and describe quite easily an actor's contribution. What is the, where does the director come in? Radio is an auto medium in that we have total control. It's unusual, like most, most mediums um, are collaborative processes. So the, the director um, can make all the choices. When you're structuring a program, it's the beginning of the program is not always obvious to you. You might actually come up with the end of the program and work backwards. It's helpful to think of beginnings, middle, and ends. There's a saying that you should always come as late as possible into a scene, and you should leave as early as possible. So if you think of the film Star Wars, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and it's got all this stuff about the Empire or whatever, and then we come into the story. So it's the same with any project that you do. You want to sort of clear out all the boring stuff and put that sort of almost like as then come into the story. You get into characterization there because if you don't know about the characters, how do you care about them? You also want to get into plot because you want to know what happens next. And there's an example of this from um, a series I did called um, Fabulous Fables. The idea behind this program is we were going to take obs more obscure fables by Aesop, you know Aesop's fables, like the donkey and the wasp or whatever, and then we found real life people whose lives in a way were like a fable. And so we were going to have the fables would be like a metaphor for these people's lives, or you could see it the other way around. Fabulous Fables. Norman, who's 80, had a wife called Bonnie. Sadly, she got Alzheimer's and slowly faded away. He needed help, and that's how he met Kath. She was sent by social services as a carer, and she looked after her pretty well. She was a very kind person. I mean, I fell in love with her. I shouldn't have done. She had this licensed caring business, after my wife died, I used to drive her around to her clients, like, in the old mini. And it started there, like, nothing happened while Bonnie was alive, but uh, when she died, it didn't take me long. So I've got nothing to be proud of, really. Kath, not a beauty. She was in her early 60s then. A blonde, well, I say blonde... She used to have it done each week. Quite a, a short, dumpy figure. But she had charisma. She knew how to handle men. Men to her were like notches on a Western cowboy's gun, or should I say rather on her bedpost. Like. <laughs> and were you one of those notches? Yes, one of many. But she was great company. And did you know that Kath was married when you started? Yes. Oh, yes. The relationship was stormy. We often used to be away on excursions for a week at a time sort of thing. Do you think her husband minded the fact that you were having an affair? Uh, I think he was used to it, you know. It's the way they live. So in a way, you could call the relationship between Kath, yourself, and her husband a, a, a menage a trois. Yes, a manager to what yeah. Yeah, that is the exact word, really, isn't it? A manager to what? Oh, yes. Yeah. She was. She was good. The Snail and the Mirror. A snail found a mirror, and when she saw how brightly he shone, she fell in love with him. She quickly climbed up onto the mirror's round surface and began to lick him. The snail clearly was no good for the mirror and only besmirched his lustrous radiance with filth and slime. 
A monkey then found the mirror after it had been dirtied by the snail and remarked, well, that's what happens when you let someone like that walk all over you. To me, actually, the most important um, specific thing that was said was um, we used to go around in the old mini. Um, I know that sounds a bit unlikely, but it's so specific, you feel it must be true. And he's, he's actually telling us a true story. And then, you know, he also reveals his attitude when he says, she had, she had this licensed caring business. You, there's an almost, the way he says that almost is an implication that she wasn't really that good a carer. <laughs> um, so the blonde thing, yeah, he says she was blonde. So, and then he says, well, I say she's blonde. So he's revealing quite a lot of attitude. But in these um, uh, specific <coughs> statements, um, you know, like, she was a short, dumpy figure. Um, you're getting, the story is actually made out of the specifics. And then the other things like the menage a trois, or at one point he says it was the way they lived. That is more, that is kind of more to do with sort of a, a more general thing about what happened. And even the way he says it was the way they lived, there's a great tiredness in his voice there, actually, the way he says that, because he will become part of the way that they lived, and it sort of will destroy him in some way. It's quite, a, quite an intimate and intense and personal little vignette. I think some people, it's fair to say, might be a bit uncomfortable um, by that. Is that. Does that bother you? Not particularly. I mean, I, I don't think our job is to make reality nicer than it is, or maybe not even make it nastier than it is. But I think if you create a feeling in people, that's good. If, when people make short films, they often make um, horror films because it's a way of creating an emotional response. So as a storyteller, you don't want to just have a story where someone went and had a cappuccino <laughs> and then came home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Stuff has got to happen. Yeah. You're talking about details and using layers of details to build a character. Are there some details that work better than others? The more specific, the better, I'd say. Visual details work very well on the radio. Maybe sound works well in film. In fact, when you read um, novels, like uh, I was reading um, some novels by um, Simonon, who wrote these detective stories, and he has a heck of a lot of sound in his books. This was a program, a series based on The Wind in the Willows. There's a bit in The Wind in the Willows where this baby weasel goes missing, and then they all have to look for this weasel, and will they find it, and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, Again, we just moved all the boring stuff up to the top of the program. And just in, in the initial announcement, just got that over really quickly and then came into the story where we wanted to. This is six minutes long. Jennifer Monroe lives in an isolated Highland Lodge near Ardguy with her husband, Marcus, who is head stalker on the estate. She has two children, Annie Rose and Cameron, who was three years old at the time. We live on the top of a mountain at the end of a road in the middle of hills and trees. Cameron, he's never really cried even when he was a little baby. He always likes to be outside and talking about what the trees are saying to each other. Could he swim? I don't think he would have been able to swim. When we go for walks, I always showed them where the rabbits live where rabbits burrow into banks, where it's dry ground, I've always said, if you ever stayed outside in the night time, I said, this would be a nice place to sleep where it's dry, mm. because if you lay in the grass, it's wet, and you wouldn't want to sleep there because you'd get very, very cold, and then you'd get sick. Who 
whose idea was it to go to the Falls of Shin for a day trip? It was my idea because I thought we would have a little treat out and go and buy an ice cream. It's very famous for they have a big falls. Um, just further down from the falls, there's a hydroelectric power station. So that's what we did. So what happened? While I was putting Annie Rose in the car... Your daughter? Yes. Cameron started walking on the path. But that little bit that he walked was into the dark, dense trees and I couldn't find him and he couldn't find his way back. It was a minute and just... And that was it, he was gone. Mo, little Portly is missing again. What, that child? said the mole. He's always straying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's so adventurous. But no harm ever happens to him. Yes, but this time it's more serious, said the rat gravely. His father, Otter's evidently more anxious than he'll admit. I got out of him that young Portly hasn't learnt to swim very well yet, and I can see he's thinking of the weir. There's a lot of water coming down, and then there are, well, traps and things, you know. Otter goes to the river every night and watches, on the chance, you know, just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking of the same thing. The lonely, heart-sore animal, crouched by the ford, watching and waiting the long night through, on the chance. I just thought I couldn't see him. I just thought I wasn't looking in the right place. I thought he must be just over there. And then I thought he must be just there. Then the man, Pete Campbell, that owns the Shin Falls, he came back to, because they were locking up, but it was shut quite early in October. At which point Pete Campbell, quite rightly, phoned my father. We couldn't find Cameron. I wasn't actually panicking at that point. I was nervous inside. But I was sure he was fine and he was just up the path. I just had to find him. It was about half past four I put Annie Rose into the car seat. And what was the weather like at that point? It had been very wet. The ground was very wet. The river was in speed. There was a lot of mud. The paths into the forest were squelchy on your shoes. Was it dark at that point? It or? wasn't too dark at that point. It got dark quite quickly at six o'clock. Rat, said the mole. I simply can't go and turn in and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem to be anything to be done. We'll get the boat out and paddle upstream. Just what I was thinking myself, said the rat. So what happened next? Um, You're right. And my father phoned my uncle. My uncle is a water bealy. What's um, that? A water bealy is somebody that looks after the rivers. My uncle arrived up and they pulled up and they both had big fishing nets. At which point a police car came. They took the view that Cameron had been taken by somebody. When I arrived, uh, PC McDonald had a, I made a cursory search of the area and the light was falling. If I remember correctly, Cameron was actually standing there when she left him. Uh, we were requesting like the RAF helicopter, the Stornoway Coast Guard helicopter, uh, mountain rescue teams, uh, the police dogs. We, we requested uh, everything we could uh, to get up here because we realised that Cameron had been missing about two and a half hours. You can see it's uh, quite treacherous, quite a steep slope towards the river. This is the only part of the river that's actually protected because there's a lot of people come down here. So this is the only bit that's fenced off. Dark and deserted as it was, the night was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling telling of the busy little population who were up and about, 
plying their trades and vocations. Do you want to start by saying a little bit of something, maybe uh, describing your approach in using sound versus using words at different points in, in a story? I increasingly don't really make a distinction between sound and words. I sort of, because words themselves seem to embody so much emotion just in the way that people are speaking. I see it all as a one. It's, I know that's not very helpful in a way, but if I could just run through what I was doing there, that might be useful actually, just in terms of um, what was I sort of going through my head in the way I constructed that. Um, I could have actually started with the waterfall because that's really the most dramatic part of it. <coughs> so um, I felt I'd keep that back because it didn't, the waterfall doesn't really happen until later in the story. Um, the waterfall is really represents the fear of everyone. <coughs> so um, if you read H.P. Lovecraft, he always talks about unspeakable horror. <laughs> so in a way you don't want to, you don't want to speak your horror. You just want to have a sense, this is just the way I work, a sense of dread that something awful is going to happen. She says her first words are something like, we live at the top of a mountain at the end of the road in the middle of hills and trees. I really like the way she said that because it was like the beginning of a fairy tale. It had a sort of epic quality about it, even though it was actually a true story. Interestingly, it's the vagueness of her words. That's what makes it a fairy tale. So even though I was talking about specifics earlier, here she's actually talking in a rather vague way. So like in Star Wars, they say, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. You know, that's actually pretty vague, but you know you're in, a, in for some kind of epic tale. The good thing about fairy tales is that you know that there's going to be danger, and you know that there might be a witch who might take the children. So that actually happens here. And also, um, fairy tales tend to have happy endings. In fairy tales, the behavior of people is tremendously important. If they're true to themselves, um, they, will, they will win out. And the mother, there's an important bit of characterization of the mother right at the beginning where she talks about how she was um, teaching Cameron to burrow and all that. So you think, well, she's a good mother. So if she's a good mother and this is a fairy tale, this should surely have a happy ending. But what if this guy's just playing around with me? Maybe I'll have a sad ending. <laughs> and then there was a question quite early on, I don't know if you noticed it, where um, the interviewer said, can you swim? So that's something that people do a lot in stories called prefiguring, which you probably read about, where you, you prefigure the story in some way and plant an idea. Um, to my mind, that was a bit heavy-handed the way I did that, actually, because it just seems to come out of nowhere. Why is she asking about whether he can swim or not? It should have just come in a different point. But that prefiguring is something that's very useful in, in narrative and worth looking into if you want to find out more about how stories work. Um, it was her idea to go to the falls. She thought it would be fun to have an ice cream. So that's a sort of rather specific thing that feels quite true. And also, if something terrible happens, then it's her fault because it was her idea. So there's a sense of guilt. So there's all these things running along, guilt, dread, goodness, badness, etc., etc. And then you get into some more scary specifics. She talks about the falls of Shin, there's some big falls. Um, there's a hydroelectric power station. You know, that's quite frightening thought, actually. You know, what are those power stations like? Uh, then we get the reading from the wind in the willows. And that's where I made a mistake in that I didn't get a famous actor. Um, I, I worked a lot with this actress who's a friend of mine and I liked a lot, and she's a good actress, but she's not famous. So if you can get a famous actor, it's much better because then you'll get more fame. <laughs> and if you get more fame, that's like sometimes called branding. You can brand yourself as being a famous person. 
So many actors actually love the wind in the willows. So I could have actually got like an A1 actor on this. I'm going to jump to a completely different program, actually. This was about obscure methods of counting sheep. And it was a sort of Radio 3 avant-garde program, part of a series called Between the Years. Seem to know when there's a storm brewing a sheep. I was just watching, that was this last fortnight when there was a storm coming, wind and rain. The whole moved across the field and we're in a line, full line behind the wall, sheltering. Marvellous thing, sheep. Does your son, you got a son carrying on farming or no, not? No, no. Oh. No, I haven't. So after my day, I don't know. Mm. And I'm, I'm on downhill now. So down, I think you're in your prime, It's actually. all downhill for me now. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to have a sense of humour on well, the Well, a lot of people hasn't. No, <laughs> you're going there. You're going there. There won't be anybody laughing and smiling. June the 1st, 1800. I observed the glittering silver line on the ridges of the backs of the sheep, which made them look beautiful, but with something of strangeness, like animals of another kind, as if belonging to a more splendid world. So these are sheep coughing. I, I didn't actually know that. I suppose it's obvious that animals do cough, um, but you, you, it's not something that you think about much. When I was making this program, I thought, oh gosh, sheep are sort of coughing. Um, this led to a whole different approach to the program, actually, which is if the, sh if the sheep sound like humans, why not make them even more human? The program that, you're, that I'm making, which is about counting sheep, that's not really what the program is about. The program is really about something else. It, for me, it's never what it says on the tin. The way that I, if you like, indicate it's about something else is through sound. Don't touch that fence with your nose, Lammy. It's electrified. Just the click of the electric box keeps the fox away. The actually ravens will even take, sometimes I've heard horrendous stories of... keeping everything that you've got alive, alive. I might really take it in turns to call. See, that's going to another you there. Yeah, it's fine. You, look, you go to the right of it. Yeah, I am. That ewe's just pushed away, butted away another lamb, which isn't hers. I'm going to go in. It's sound, it's smell, it's vital to get that bond in there. Sheep. Sheep are worth a lot of money now. Ten sheep, a thousand pounds. No, if you're selling sheep for slaughter and you're, you're a rogue, you pick them up now, tomorrow morning they're in the slaughterhouse, heads are off by 10 o'clock, who's going to know? you got a torch, yeah, I can just feed them and have a look at yeah, them. Okay, let's do that, fine. We had 186 lambs pinched out of the field at the point of Bloomsbury Pub. One Saturday night we come, we pinched a lorry off a local farm. Rounded them up and took them off. And that was the last we seen of them. You have to sort of listen to the world. You have to sort of observe the world. If you're making an art project, you have to sort of be 
not just try and think you're this great director or whatever, controlling everything, but the world is sort of speaking to you and you've got to observe what it's saying and then be open to that and then use that as part of your creativity rather than just try and control everything. When you start a project, your starting point is literal, like that clip at the very beginning with Galileo. That's your starting point, but you know, the advantage of, of working in the world is that the world will give you clues as how, how not to be literal. And I think it's, personally, I think it's much more interesting not to be literal um, because it's more surprising. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs>